Thank you for coming. Today we have a special guest, um, Adolfo Sistana from Chile, from Tarapacá University and also Italy, the uh, Triento, sorry, Triento, the Institute, uh, Instituto Nacional de Física Nuclear. Uh, so today he's going to talk about black holes, black bones actually with the scalar curve. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are going to continue where we stopped before in the morning. And this was well, actually, you can use this. We stop here. So we finished with the explaining a little bit the magnetic, the Dirac, Dirac magnetic monopole, and we more or less understood how much is uh, in connection with the Taunat space time, right? So basically, what Misner did to try to avoid this axis of symmetry, which is pathological, is pretty much based on one Dirac did to define the vector potential of a magnetic monopole, right? And being the magnetic monopole, this single monopole magnetic charge that we are putting by hand in uh, Maxwell Gauss law, in order just to uh, have this single charge there, right? But now there is another interpretation of the Taunat space time that says, okay, I don't care so much if there is this topological axis, okay? And we are, and this is due to Bonner, and the idea is that, okay, they, he was trying to analyze this space time, uh, no matter that the axis was, uh, the axis of rotation is a little bit pathological, topologically speaking, and he said, okay, let us consider the axis there, and let us see how the space time anyway behaves by not identifying the time coordinate according to the Mister string, okay? So the, 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 the Mister string is gonna be there, it's gonna be a topological defect, and let's see what this space-time tell us anyway, no by trying to hide the Mister string with the previous trick that we know is a nice trick based on the Mister and on the Dirac monopole strategy, but that unfortunately has some consequences, like for example, the identification of the time coordinate, so then we get closed time like curves, and also the fact that then the maximal extension of the space-time is not housed anymore, so we don't have the topology we need to describe the theory. So Bonner, in this approach, as I was telling you before, uh, Mr. strings are not avoided by any identification of the time coordinate, and they are going to be treated as a sort of topological defect that is going to be usually interpreted as a semi-infinite road with a spin. Let us remember that the Taunat space-time is stationary, and there is some kind of cross term there that in induce us to think that the solution is rotating, right? Because we have this dt d phi term in the metric. That's the first thing. And let us remember from the first uh, lecture that <coughs> always by, I have a full axis of rotation in the Taunat metric which is topological, which is problematic, but let us remember that always I can make at least one coordinate transformation such that only half of the axis is problematic. So I can always solve half of the problem and either have the north pole without the axis or the south pole without the axis. Remember that that's what we did here, right? Just by a simple coordinate of transformation. Then we are not going to say that we are going to divide the space-time into patches such that I am not seeing this part. Here the idea was, okay, I do one coordinate transformation, so this full axis which is pathological it's going to be divided in two. Either I'm going to, ha I'm going to either have a, patho a pathology in the north pole, in the north axis, or in the south one. But because I am in this Mr. string, I will have access only to the hemisphere which is free of pathologies. Now we are not going to do that. We are going to have half of the access with this uh, pathology, and we will have access to the full chart. Okay? We are not going to divide the theta coordinate in two charts. So, in this case, it's always possible to show that the town not space time in the so called Levels by Papa Petru coordinates might represent the exterior field of a rotating source in, of which its angular momentum is measured by the nut charge. So, if, if we analyze the nut space time in some kind of cylindrical coordinates, the most general cylindrical space, the most general space time with cylindrical symmetries are described by this metric, the Levels by Papa Petru metric. And due to the form of the town nut metric, we can change a little bit the initial coordinates I show you in the Taunat space-time. 
to put them in the form of Level by Papapetro. When you do that, <coughs> uh, you can see that the exterior field described by the down and out metric somehow describes a rotating source. Okay? And this rotating source has some angular momentum, and this angular momentum is shown to be proportional to a nut charge, actually. Okay? Uh, now, in this case, the missing string represents an unrememorable quasi regular singularity and is naturally so in the questioning of the geodesic completeness of the space time. So basically now, because I will have always this axis, which is a quasi regular singularity, and I am saying quasi regular in the sense that this is not a curvature singularity. Remember that the space time has no curvature singularity. The um, contractions of the Riemann tensor are finite and well behaved everywhere from r equal to minus infinity to plus infinity. This is a singularity in the sense that now there is something going on in the axis. We know the axis is not regular anymore, right? In this case, half of the axis only. Well, recently, well, not, not recently, but a few years ago in 2015, Clement Galsov and collaborators shown that actually by no using the trick of misness, you can anyway make invisible the missing string for some particular type of observers. So I am in the Taunade space time and I am a random observer, I might be geodesic or not. In principle, there is always a missing string. Half of the axis is going to be, by sure, uh, <coughs> singular, right? But Galsov and company, they show that actually you can use a similar trick of the one used by Misner and company to, sh to prove that geodesic observers can, let's say, avoid the presence of the missing string. So basically he said, okay, let us make a similar change of coordinate as the one uh, we did before in the missing string. Let's say that the time coordinate is going to be time prime coordinate plus c. This constant c I show you in the, in the plot with the spheres, okay? But I'm not going to tell you how much is the value. I'm just going to tell you that there's a constant c there. And then transform, use this coordinate transformation in the metric, write down the space times. And what they did is that they were able to constrain the value of this constant c such that a geodesic observer, so an observer that is free falling in the Taunat metric, will never see the missing string if c is accordingly constrained. Okay? So it's a little bit different of Misner trick because Misner trick was dividing the space type in two charts, right? So such that you are in the North Pole, I send the missing strings to the South and so on. Now the missing string is there, half of the axis is there, but now I am a, only a geodesic observer <coughs> and I have applied a particular coordinate transformation that constrains the value of this constant C. When this value is properly constrained, this uh, missing string might be avoided, but only by geodesic observer. Moreover, they show also that this observer, when this constant is constrained, also do not face any causal causality violation. So before I told you that the, the tau nut has also a second pathology, that is usually you have gen the generic existence or appearance of cluster like curves, right? Which are causality violations. By following the approach of these people, which is by, uh, based on Bonner interpretation of the Taunat space time, you can also avoid the presence of this causality violation by constraining this constant C. Okay? And well, just to close, let me tell you that all of these pathologies can be easily avoided if you gave up on working with Lorentzian solutions and you go to Euclidean solutions. So the metric is not Lorentzian anymore. It has no. Uh, time-like coordinate again uh, anymore, like time, and everything is plus signature, and you are in Euclidean space-time. These solutions in Euclidean space-time <coughs> are pretty well known and they are investigated a lot because they represent instantons or gravitational instanton solutions that are especially uh, important in quantum gravity. So basically, anyway, if you don't want to continue in the Lorentzian space-time, these tau nut space-times are pretty, pretty important in this context. Okay? But we are going to continue in the Lorentzian case because we are working here with these black holes that I'm going to show you. So a question we can um, ask ourselves is the following. <coughs> so far we have talked only about vacuum solutions, right? Everything I told you before was Einstein theory in, va in vacuum. So is, the, is there any type of field 
than when back reacting on a tau nut space time open somehow the road to cure these pathologies? So can I put some kind of matter on top of my tau nut space time such that maybe the missing string can be partially solved or also these causality violations we have been discussed? Well, in order to discuss that, we need to understand what it means to include these other extra fields into, into a given space time. Okay? So if you recall that I show you the full plebiansky Yemiansky family, in the full plebiansky Yemiansky family, all the black holes contained in there, containing in there, the Kerr, the Ryder Nostrum, Schwarzschild, Symmetric, and Taunat, all of them were described by a particular set of parameters, so some charge that describe this space time. And these parameters were basically the angular momentum that describes rotations, the mass, and the electromagnetic charge, right? So <clears throat> in order to understand what kind of other black holes I can uh, obtain when I am putting different type of uh, matters around, the first thing that we usually try to understand or to study are these so-called non-hair theorems. So some theorems that tell us, okay, you have a theory, Whatever you put on top of this theory, uh, when, the, when, when your space-time or your body with any kind of field you have collapse, basically these theorems tell us, okay, no matter what kind of fields are you going to put, the final result of the gravitational collapse is going to be always a black hole that is described only by this restricted set of parameters, mass and angular momentum of charge. Those, those statements are called as the non-hair theorem of the non-hair conjecture, okay? And it's basically based on the fact that in GR, in vacuum, people know pretty well that the only family of solutions you can obtain there is the Kerr family. So every time I have GR in vacuum and I solve the field equations, I know that what I am going to obtain is the Kerr family of black holes. And in the Kerr family, these metrics are described by mass, charge, and angular momentum. So these things invited people to state that no matter if my black hole was formed by leptons, baryons, some type of fluid, whatever I have around, any type of scalar, when the collapse is settled down to equilibrium, all this information about these fields is either radiated away from the black hole while it's still uh, dynamic, or is eaten up by the black hole and, high and hidden behind the horizon. Okay? Such that at the end, the, the black hole is a kind of bald object with no extra parameter describing the final state. This is more or less the idea of this uh, hair conjecture. <coughs> Nevertheless, this, uh, this, this conjecture that is uh, upgraded to a theorem in some uh, particular theories is a theory dependent statement. So to know if actually there is a mathematical proof that your theory, that in your theory all black holes are going to be hairless or that doesn't make any sense to include other fields beyond the ones that describe rotation, mass, and angular momentum, sorry, and electromagnetic charge, you need to analyze this for every theory, right? So when we are working on black holes and we want to see if black holes exist in theories that are going beyond general relativity or in general relativity plus some particular type of fields, like for example scalars or some more sophisticated or involved type of electromagnetic fields like Broca fields, so um, non-linear electrodynamics, whatever. Well, you need to analyze, okay, let me see if there is a non hair theorem in this particular theory that is ruling out the existence of black holes with more fields that might describe the final state of the collapse, okay? <coughs> and usually that's what you have to do. Now, which is the simplest type of field we have at hand to try to investigate if I may have a black hole which is described by something else than mass, charge, and angular momentum? Well, in principle, <clears throat> the simplest type of field we have is a scalar field, right? So it makes sense to start looking for, uh, searching for uh, what we call a scalar here. Somehow a scalar here is simplest than electromagnetic fields, but electromagnetic fields are easily included in the GR regime, right? So for example, the rain, someone may ask, okay, but what happened with the electromagnetic, the, with the Rayner Nostrum solution? So I have Schwarzschild, and then I put electromagnetic charge, it seems to be a kind of electromagnetic hair, no? But it's naturally contained by the theory. So I can, electromagnetic charge for somehow uh, do not enter in conflict with this. And you can actually obtain solutions which have charge. And these are spin one fields that are in principle more involved than just scalars, no? 
But when you put a scalars, the scalars are pretty difficult. And it took a long time for people to actually find regular black hole solutions with the scalar here. Well, one of the first solutions that was found or in a kind of somehow well-motivated model is this solution I am showing here. So consider the following action, which is GR with cosmological constant. Now we are not, again, we stop being in just pure vacuum. So we are going to include a cosmological constant and this particular scalar field interaction. If you see, this is going to be more technical than in the morning. So sorry for that, but it's unavoidable. So you will have a kinetic term for the scalar and some potential, okay? And this potential here is fixed to be the conformal one. So alpha phi 4, this potential uh, is uh, invariant under viral scaling, okay? And you have a non-minimal coupling here, which is given by this particular coupling in between the scalar and the Ricci scalar, the Ricci, the, the contractions, the double contraction of the Riemann tensor, okay? And this action is known as, this system is known as Einstein gravity supplemented with non-minimally coupled scalar fields or conformal scalar Einstein theory, okay? Why? Because this part of the action, the scalar sector, the equation of motion from the scalar field is invariant under a rescale, um, by rescaling of the metric. So there is some sort of by invariance there, okay? And for this to be true, you need this coupling and you need the potential of the scalar field to be precisely the one that is there. If this is phi, is another. If this is a potential and it's another function of phi, this is not invariant and the by rescaling anymore and you don't have this symmetry in the field equation for the scalar field anymore, okay? So in this model, with and without cosmological constant and for an arbitrary based manifold that might be of constant curvature, that might be an sphere, an hyperboloid, or a torus. This is the black hole solution. Actually, we know that there is a black hole solution there, and it's easy to integrate, and this is the scalar field configuration. Okay? This solution is known as a solution with secondary type of here. Why secondary? Because if you see the metric, it's still described by the mass, basically, no? The mass is still the charge there, and this belongs to this set of parameters I told you before. But now there is also a scalar field around that although is not entering with any integration constant here, so you don't see any trace of the scalar field inside the metric. But nevertheless, there is a non-trivial configuration of a scalar field around the black hole. This type of hair is called secondary hair. Okay? And eventually, if you find a black hole solution in which actually the scalar field has a new integration constant or a new charge, let's say a scalar charge, and this scalar charge actually appears in the metric, then you see that this is primary here. But these solutions with primary here are much more difficult to find. So this is uh, an example of a Hayley solution. This is called the empty zeta black hole, and it was found by some Chilean physicists actually, and it's the generalization of an older black hole called the BBM black hole, which is uh, Bronikov, Melnikov, Bojarova, Bekenstein black hole. That is the case in which there is no potential and there is no cosmological constant. That's actually one of the first uh, black hole solutions with some sort of hair that was found, okay? Notice that the scalar field, it seems to explode here. It has a singularity in R equal M. Nevertheless, if you compute the horizons for this metric, you see that this conflictive point is a line behind the horizon, okay? It's covered. So in the domain of outer communications, the space-time is, and the scale is regular. Okay, so let me go fast. So then when I was starting my PhD with my advisor, we found a solution for a, for a theory which is pretty much the same I showed you before, but with a minimal deviation in the scalar field. So we say, okay, let's see what happens if actually the potential deviates a little bit for, con for the conformal, from this viral scale and symmetry, you know, the conformal symmetry. So let us move from phi4 and we, are, we arrive to the result that actually there is a new family of black hole solutions that arise when this potential, sorry, is complemented by this cubic and this linear term. Two more terms in the potential. So it's basically this theory here, but this phi4 is replaced by this potential with more terms, okay? And when you do that, you find this new black hole, which now has two different metric functions. I have this metric function here entering GTT and GRR, but I also have this function outside that if you see there, if you put attention, looks like a conformal factor, right? 
it looks like I have, in between these two square brackets, it seems I have precisely the same metric than before. Actually, it's the same metric. But this metric, this metric, has been multiplied, multiplied by this conformal factor. Okay? And the scalar fields are not the same anymore. Actually, you see that now the scalar field has been kind of shifted from the previous configuration, from this one. Well, we found this solution just by brute force, by integrating the field equation, and we realized it's a, a nice space-time that it represents several types of solutions. And why this is important in the context of the, of the work I am going to show you is because of the following, because uh, <coughs> it was <coughs> then observed that actually the empty zeta family, the metric I showed you before, and the metric of our new solution are easily related just by a conformal transformation and a field and a shift of the of the original scalar field. So actually there was no need to go into the process of integrating the field equation from the scratch and work in trying to solve these Einstein equations. But actually they are easily connected by a by a simple transformation, which is take the empty zeta metric, multiply it by some particular conformal factor, that was this one. We of course obtain the conformal factor by integrating it, but we, I will show you the specific form of these transformations in general. So basically, take the empty zeta, apply a conformal viral scaling, you obtain a new metric, take your scalar field and make some particular shift, and what you will obtain is this new space-time. And this new space-time that has been obtained just by applying this transformation is pretty interesting because before the empty zeta solution only describes some black holes. With different causal structure, there are some subtleties there, but basically they describe black holes. But the new space-time, the one we obtained, and that is related to the empty zeta solution by these transformations, not only represent black holes, but also represent regular black holes, the kind of black holes we are interested on it, on, and it also represents warm holes, and in some cases, bouncing cosmologies. These solutions I told you at the very beginning that were of cosmological nature, right? That they avoid the big bang by bouncing um, in the cosmological evolution. And this, uh, to understand this well, let me show you which are precisely this transformation. This was done in this paper by some collaborators from Chile, Mexico, and I call them the Hassan, no, the Ion Hassan Zabaleta transformation, which are the surnames of these people, uh, friends of mine too. So let us take now the conformally coupled action, but in dimension D, in any dimension. So now I'm not in dimension four anymore, okay? In dimension D, this factor that was one over six before, now becomes this factor in terms of the, of the dimension. And this action, when this potential is the conformal potential, which in arbitrary dimension is given by this, you may see that if I put d equal 4 here, I obtain phi up to 4, right? So you have a divided by 2, you have 4 here. This is the conformal potential in arbitrary dimension. If <coughs> this action is invariant under this conformal transformation, okay, so I take my metric and I rescale it by this function of the coordinates and I take my scalar field and I change it according to this. These people, they show that actually <coughs> once these field equations are solved, the field equations of this first model are solved, you obtain a solution g mu nu phi a mu, which by means of this particular set of transformations, so this is my metric, the previous metric, this is the previous scalar, this is the previous gauge field. I put them into these equations which define a set of transformations. These transformations are going to give me a new solution with g mu bar phi bar, a mu bar, <coughs> being solving the field equations of this new action. See, please, that observe that I put bar on everything here. So this is a new action in terms of these fields that have bar. And if you may tell me, well, but these two actions are pretty similar. Look, they have precisely the same terms. Well, indeed, they are pretty similar, but there are two particular differences. First, that the cosmological constant now, this small lambda is not the capital lambda I put before. It's a new cosmological constant that has been somehow uh, modified by the transformations. And the potential, B of phi bar, is not the conformal potential anymore that was considered here. It's going to be a new potential. And the forms of lambda and B new bar are these two expressions. So the new cosmological constant gets this effective value that, of course, depends on the previous one. 
And the potential now is different. It has all of these terms. If I put d equal 4 in these expressions, we are going to precisely obtain the solutions I show you was the generalization of the empty zeta. So I put d equal 4 and this, is, this lambda will transform in this lambda here that I showed you before. And my potential, this huge expression for the potential I show you in this general formula will reduce to the linear cubic and quartic. So when d is equal 4, all this ugly expression reduced to alpha 1 phi, alpha 3 phi cube, alpha 4 phi up to 4. Okay? So basically what they do, what they did, they found the particular transformation that connect these two theories. And this potential is interesting because when you have also the electromagnetic charges, in dimension 3, 4 and 6, this potential is known as the super renormalizable potential because it contains all uh, <coughs> natu na natural powers of the scalar field. So for example in dimension 4 we have phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4. Okay? Okay, so now this is up to here we were doing, we, I was showing you also only some black holes that were static and spherically symmetric and that has some kind of uh, a scalar here, right? But our aim from the very beginning and now we are arriving to what we wanted to do, finally, was to describe this so-called so, so, so black bounce transition, this kind of black holes that are regular and that transit in between some configurations that I told in the morning were wormholes and these bouncing cosmologies. So <clears throat> what we are going to do is that we are going to show that by the transformations I showed you before in the previous slide uh, and working at another space time, so no spherically symmetric anymore or static, the solutions you obtain by means of these transformations are precisely of the type we are looking for. We are going to precisely obtain black bounces that represents regular black holes, wormholes and bouncing cosmologies. Okay? <laughs> so the first things we need to do is to define which is going to be the seed space-time, which is the space-time that we are going to transform under the transformations I show you. And this space-time needs to be a solution of the initial theory. Right? This is the first ingredient. And moreover, because we are working in uh, Taunate space-time, what we are looking for to, to use as a seed is a black hole solution that is going to be of the Taunate space-time type and that is going to solve these field equations. This is the first thing we need to do, to define a seed. Once the seed for this conformally coupled theory with the scalars is known, we will apply the transformations. We, will, we know that the transformations will, will, are going to deliver a new solution that is going to be a solution of this slightly different theory, right? To this one. And once we have that solution, what we need to, to do is analyze the solutions we get there, the space times, and to see if they represent or not the black bounces we are looking for, okay? <clears throat> so, before showing you precisely the form of the solution we obtained, just one slide to tell you about this black bounce. So what people start doing recently, or I don't know, one year and a half, two years, was the following. So they took the, the first black bounce solution was this black bounce uh, proposed by Bissell and Simpson and that corresponds to a minimalistic deviation from Schwarzschild black hole. So this is the metric of, if you kill this factor A, what you get here is basically a Schwarzschild metric, right? So they say, okay, let us put by hand this parameter here. They are not solving the field equations of any theory. They say, okay, let us take this parameter here and here, and let's see, let us analyze from a geometrical point, geometric point of view what this space-time represents. And they realized that, actually, by just simply modifying this, you get uh, regular black holes for some values of A. For other values of A, actually, you get wormholes that are one-way traversables and wormholes that are go and back also uh, traversables. And that these configurations somehow transit in between them by just moving this continuous parameter A. The thing is that these solutions that has this nice property of being regular, blah, blah, and then connecting different universes that also represent wormholes and so on, these solutions are, these metrics are not solutions of any theory. What it means that I don't know which is the action or the field equations that once are solved give me this space-time. 
okay? So our idea was, okay, if people is working a lot on this black bounce, because there was not only the Churchill case, there was also the one with charge, people also start looking care, black bounce and so on, uh, let us put them in a theory. So it makes more sense because now I have a theory, I solve the field equation, so I have an exact solution, and I will like this exact solution to be a black bounce with these properties. So that's what we did. That's what our initial motivation. So in order to do that, well, I will skip how much of them, maybe? Like 15 minutes more, no? 20. Let us start uh, talking about the seed. This is going to be more technical, but at the, at the end, the result, which is actually, I'm going to show you some graphic and so on, is going to be more, you can, you can, will understand better the idea, the final idea. So the seed, as I told you, needs to be a solution of Einstein with conformally coupled scalar field for a, for a tau nut space time. Okay? This solution actually exists and was found in uh, 2013 by some uh, French collaborators. And this is the form of the metric. So I take this space time that is basically of the tau nut type. Okay? This B is nothing else than the cross term in the tau nut metric. Do you see that? So look, let me, I know it's annoying, but let me go to tau nut, to the first one. This is a tau nut. Look. Now replace this by an arbitrary function f. Because now I'm solving a different theory. It's not gr, so of course the function metric is going to be different, right? Put here an f, put here an f. Here, where I have a two sphere, put a um, base manifold of constant curvature. A sphere, hyperboloid torus. And here, this term depends directly on what I put here. So if I put a sphere here, here appears this cosine. If I put a plane here, only appears theta. And if I put an hyperboloid, here I get an hyperbolic sine or cosine. Okay? So now, in the, in the previous metric form of the metric I show you here, I just put a calligraphic B that represents any of these cases. Okay? So let's go back to that metric. Okay, so this is a tau nut metric answer. And they integrate the field equations and they realize that actually the metric function is given by this expression you see here, where the scalar field is now given by this expression, pretty similar to the empty theta solution I showed you before, because this actually this is nothing else than the tau nut extension of the empty theta black hole. And this is the gauge field. And see that, observe that always in the tau nut space time, even if you have only electric charge, not magnetic charge, you always get a magnetic component here, okay? And this makes sense if you recall all the properties I told you before about the Taunat space-time, right? That naturally include some kind of uh, magnetic interaction there, right? Okay. Now this is what more or less what Jorge, you were saying. You see that our, our theory is conformally invariant. It's invariant under viral scaling, the uh, scalar part, right? The metric has this kind of, without cosmological constant, kill this, will have this conformal, uh, sorry, this extremal term. So then this, ex it, this, if I kill lambda, if I am in the case with no cosmological constant, even in this theory, which is the, of the tau nut type, with the scalar field, the metric look, will look like a Rainer Nostrum solution, which is uh, extremal. Do you see that? Let me kill, let me kill, kill also the nut charge. So if I go to the empty theta, black hole, and you kill this lambda, sorry, this is my, if you kill cosmological constant here, what do you get? One minus m divided by r squared, right? This is extremal, the extremal version of this very simple metric I showed you before. It's basically related m and q such that that factor can be written as, uh, as having a multiplicity two root, right? So r minus m squared. If q and little q and little m are related such that I can make this perfect square then, right? Okay, so this is the, so let us continue with the seed. And this is the seed and this solves the equations that I showed you before. 
This is going to be the seed. This is a known black hole that went after we apply our transformations. It's going to give you a new space time given by all of these quantities with bar. So G mu nu bar, A mu bar, phi bar, that according to our study in, um, delivers the black bounds we are looking for. So this black hole has some properties. I'm going to tell you about the seed properties because they are important to understand then the properties of the transform solution. But when I apply the transformation on this space time, what I get are going to be tau nut black bounces. So solutions that are going to represent regular black holes, wormholes, bouncing cosmology, and different transitions in between them. Okay. So if I take this seed and I look for the even horizons, I found that there are four uh, horizons in this uh, solution that I call R plus plus, R plus, R minus, and R minus minus. There is no curv curvature singularity whatsoever in the metric. There is only the mission string that we know is part of Taunat space times, right? And the possibility, possibility so far, of having closed time like curves. Two pathologies that we need to assume uh, when we are working with these Taunat space times. And this is how this uh, or killing horizons are distributed respect to the mass m and to the origin r equals zero. Remember that here there is no curve of singularity, so in principle this radial corner can go from minus infinity to mass infinity. Okay, so we should consider also this negative, this completely negative uh, clean horizon. And if the cosmological constant is positive, then L bar is given by this expression here. If the cosmological constant is negative, L bar is given by this different expression here. Remember that k can be one minus one or zero or zero, and it just represents the curvature of either the sphere, either the torus, either the hyperbola. Okay, so these horizons, for all of them to exist, if you see there is a square root here, some conditions need to be met. These conditions are the following. So the first one is that L bar this definition here needs to be real. So indeed the cosmological constant and the curvature of the base manifold need to be somehow related such that I am not getting anything complex here. This is the first thing. The second one is that these roots, these square roots here, also need to be real such that these killing horizons are real, right? These two conditions imply these two restrictions here. So first of all L need to be real and m for those ones l bar is real, those square roots in the killing horizons are going to be real if m is constrained in between, is constrained in between these two uh, values. Okay? And this is telling to me, okay, if the cosmological constant is negative, need to be, sorry, if it's positive, need to be smaller than this value, and if it's negative, the, the, the cosmological constant need to be also small than this value. Okay, so this is a little bit redundant because of course I could have written on only one and then it's understood that the, the absolute value is the one taking place there, no? Okay, so now let me see. So if the cosmological con if the mass satisfy this thing, satisfy these conditions, what I get is that I have four horizons distributed in this way. Okay, sorry for my artistic uh, talent here, but I, I think found a better way to, <laughs> to draw this. So you have R plus plus, S plus, R equal M, that is interesting because in R equal M is the pole of the scalar field, no? R minus, R zero, R equal zero, R minus minus. Now see what happens if uh, I decide to violate, to violate this bound. Let's see what, ha what happens if I go beyond this value, if M is here to the other side. What happens is actually that these two horizons, R plus and R plus plus, these two square roots became complex. So these two horizons disappear and only R minus and R mal minus remain. Sorry. So then in that scenario you have R plus, this point where the scalar field somehow diverge, but this point now is not covered by any horizon, and you have R minus, R zero, R minus minus. Okay? The scalar, the, the scalar R equal M, which produces the divergence in the scalar. Yes. Yeah. It's uncovered now. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. So, if all horizons appear because these conditions are met, you have R plus 
plus F plus covering the region which is in red, which is where the scalar field has a conflict. Okay, okay. And then you have R minus R zero, R equals zero, R minus minus. But now if I decide to violate this bound, so I move, I consider masses that are greater than the value, these two horizons disappear. And now the scalar field pole is uncovered. So basically, you see that there is a problem there with the scalar. And then you still maintain R minus R zero and R minus. This is important because then when we are going to apply the transformations, we will see that actually we can skip this situation. And we will see how our solutions actually improve this situation. That's why I'm putting attention on this. This is only properties of the seed, something that was already done, okay? And another point is that here in this, let's say, outer region, when you don't have the horizon, well, it's like como media hora. <laughs> okay, give me 10 plus uh, some extension. <laughs> so in this area, you, in this region, you have that if lambda, if the cosmological constant is positive, so if we are in a seated universe, the function f of r that appears in the metric is always negative. The function f of r is always negative. That implies that the space-time here is of cosmological nature, right? You, well, you know probably that if you have a space-time which is of, of the sitter type, so the cosmological constant is positive, and you are, you are going far in R, so you are going close to infinity, if the cosmological constant is positive, the metric of your space-time change uh, coordinate and the time and the radial coordinate is there. So what is time becomes R and what is R becomes time. So far in infinity when you have a positive cosmological constant, your metric is actually of the cosmological nature, right? That's why in, in the seated space-time appears this so-called cosmological horizon. So here, when you eliminate these two horizons and the cosmological constant is negative, a positive, sorry, you have a cosmological space-time. If the cosmological constant is negative, everything is still normal and you have a stationary space-time. So things depend on R there and not on time. Okay. This analysis of, of these properties of the C solution need to be carried out in a few cases. Not only the, the cases are not only divided by if the cosmological constant is positive or negative, but we need also to take into account the three possible geometries of the base manifold, right? If the base manifold is a sphere, k equal one. If it's an hyperbola, k minus one. If it's a torus, k equals zero. Don't worry, I'm not going to torture, torture you with all the cases, but there are two cases that are important. Because as I told you before, this L bar parameter we defined that appears in the horizons depends on two things. Depends on K and on lambda. So for example, in the first one, when the cosmological constant is positive, if these two things have different signs, we have a problem, right? If K divided by lambda is negative, this is going to be complex, one situation. The same in the other. They need to, be, they need to have different signs because if the, in the cosmological constant is negative, if these two guys have different sign, then it's okay. But if they have the same sign, this might be complex, right? Do you agree? Yeah, okay. So there are a few things we can say when, the cos when k, is k is equal 1 and the cosmological constant is positive, and the cosmological constant is restricted to this value. And there are two things that are happening. So let me go here. When the cosmological constant is positive, k equal 1. This, two this four horizon appears. And this horizon is a cosmological horizon for the reasons I explained to you before. And R plus is an even horizon. I violate the bound, and what I get here is a cosmological space time with these horizons here. Okay? This is what happened. Now, if the cosmological constant is negative and is restricted to this thing, to these uh, bounds, but k now is equal to minus 1, so I have an hyperbola in the base manifold, situation is similar. But now R plus plus is not a cosmological horizon, it's an even horizon. And R plus is an inner horizon, okay? And when I again cross this bound, these two horizons disappear, but what I get here is a stationary space-time, a space-time that still depends on the radial coordinate but not on time, okay? These are the properties of this uh, seed solution extremely, in an extremely rough way, okay? And one important detail, in the case of cosmological constant negative and k equal 1, for this particular solution, you can see that the scalar field solves somehow the problem of the, <coughs> of the closed time light curves. Because you can see 
that if this bound is satisfied, uh, so it's a technical detail, but if this condition that I'm writing you here is met, for this particular solution, this particular space-time, you can solve the, the existence of close time-like curves. And this is pretty interesting. Why? Because we knew from the very beginning that tau space spacetimes they have these close time-like curves. If you only include cosmological constant, you still have them. But if you include cosmological constant at this type of particular scalar field, with this particular type of metric given by the, this kind of extremal form that the conformally coupled scalar field is given to the metric, just for in this case, you have the chance to satisfy this condition such that no closed time life score are going to appear. Okay, so here you see an example of a type of a scalar that is modified enough the geometry to save us from these pathologies. This is only possible in the k, k equal minus one, so hyperbolic foliation case and negative cosmological constant. Okay. So now, uh, do I have uh, so? So this is how now the new solution looks. So now you take the previous seed I was explaining to you, you take the metric, the scalar, and the gauge field, you put them into the transformations I show you, and what is delivering to us is this metric, which is again of the form of the previous metric here in these brackets times a conformal factor. Okay? And again the scalar field gets a shift. Again, there is an effective cosmological constant, and again, the potential, the scalar potential that was conformal in the seed, now get all the modifications that convert it into the supernormalizable potential, right? This is what I told you in abstract term in a vitality dimension before. Now we are in an example, in the Taunat type of metric. So this is our new solution, okay? This is the gauge field. And now you have to do is take the seed, we transform it and now analyze every case. K equal 1, cosmological constant positive, K minus 1, negative cosmological constant. There are several cases. And two important things need to be said, said before to <coughs> analyze and to uh, see which are actually the final solutions. First, that now the conformal factor that is here has a pole here. And it also has a value in which it became zero. This two, this, this pole and this zero of the conformal factor change a lot the geometry of the new solution. First, the zero, so the zero coming from the numerator, induce the presence of a curvature singularity. So it's going to be a curvature singularity in the new metric. Okay? Before in Taunat, pure Taunat, there was no curvature singularity. And second of all, this pole divides the space time into regions. When this pole <coughs> belongs to the range of the value of the radial coordinate. Why? Because this conformal factor sent me to a new asymptotic region. So I am somewhere in infinity, I start moving, and at some point I'm going to arrive to R equal M. But in R equal M, my conformal factor explodes. So actually, I cannot arrive to R equal M, and it sent me to a new asymptotic region, right? Some kind of conformal infinity. This is the Adolfo, so important point. So that you, remove, you remove the singularity in the scalar field, but you how to pay a price, and the price is to... You will have a new curvature singularity in the metric. Image. But I want to show you why this is not so complicated, and why you actually, anyway, get regular black holes. Okay? So this is the metric, blah, blah, blah. We need to get, take care of this curvature singularity that appear here, and we need to take care of the conformal factor. Okay? I'm going to be fast now. So this curvature singularity might be located either in the positive range of the R coordinate or in the negative uh, side, right? Because it might be the case that this factor actually is greater than M, according to the values of A, B, M, and N. Or it might be the case that this one is smaller. So I have several cases according to the sign of M, the sign of A and B, and their values, right? So I have different locations for this positive singularity. An easy case, for example, I can tell you is immediately that this guy is smaller than M. So at some R, at some positive R, there is a curvature singularity, you know it's there. By, by negative. Well, there are six combinations that in the original paper we put. Now I'm going to show you only one. Okay? The second important thing is that no matter where it is, see if it's uh, in a positive with a negative uh, value of the radial coordinate, your space time is going to arrange the radial coordinate from the curvature singularity to infinity, right? This is going to be the physical space time. 
Once you arrive to a curvature singularity, the space time is, is cut there, right? So for, for the Schwarzschild metric, the radial coordinate goes to r to infinity, from r equals zero to infinity, right? Because in r equals zero, actually have a singularity. Normal tau nut, I don't have singularity, so I can go from minus infinity to infinity. In here, you will have a singularity at r zero plus minus. So every time I have either r, r zero plus or r zero minus, this is going to define from where my radial coordinate is going to start, up to infinity. Okay. Okay. So. Let me consider the simplest case. The simplest case is that m is greater than this value where a, b satisfy this. And this is a curvature singularity that is located in a positive value of the radial coordinate. Okay, so I have then that this positive value r0. This implies that my space time, the radial coordinate, belongs to this interval, 0 plus to infinity, where 0 plus is here, this, okay? Oh, sorry. Ah, give me, give me some time, okay. So, and <coughs> okay, so this is the radial, uh, the, the value of the radial coordinate. And now you need to see where the conformal factor is respect to this coordinate singularity. Because if the coordinate singularity is in R plus, but my conformal factor that somehow divide my space time is behind, then do not, do not belong to the space time, right? Because it's behind the curvature singularity. So I will not take care of this conformal factor pole. But if the conformal factor pole, which is in R equal M, is actually at the right side of the curvature singularity, then I will have this division of my space time. So I need to take care of that, right? So in this case, where R0 is positive, let uh, observe that the conformal factor R equal M is greater than R0 plus. Why? Because R0 is defined by this. So actually R0, is m is m minus something. So r0 is, slow, is, is uh, smaller than r equal m, right? My conformal factor is, imagine this is not here, my conformal factor is the pole is at r equal m, but the singularity is at r equal m minus something. So this singularity is smaller than my conformal factor, my conformal factor then lies to the right of the singularity, so it's part of the space time. When we have that situation, what happens is that the space-time is divided in two regions that I call calligraphic R- minus and calligraphic R+. Plus. Calligraphic R- minus is going to a uh, range between R0+, plus, that I put it somewhere here, and R equal M, which is this red line. And the R, and the R calligraphic plus region is going to be in between, defined by the region between M and infinity. Okay? And now this is important and this is why the transformations are important because now I took the seed and I divide this space time that was going from uh, minus infinity to infinity in two regions. The one that goes from the singularity to the pole of the conformal factor, the one that goes from the conformal factor to plus infinity. And in between these two regions, there is a distribution of horizons, right? The horizons of my solution, the same horizons of the seed solution. So now I need to understand where the horizons R plus plus, R plus, R minus lies uh, are respect to these regions. And each of these regions in which different horizons might be lying inside are going to represent different space times. So let me give you an example. Let's go to the case lambda greater than zero k equal one, okay? In this case, the mass parameter needs to be restricted by these conditions, okay? Don't, ex don't ask me why now, but needs to be restricted by these conditions. And you have the cosmological constant restricted by this, and these distributions of horizons. So you have two horizons, R++ and R+, that are actually in the, re in the positive calligraphic R region, right? We because M is the one that divides space-time. And then you have two, one horizon in between the conformal factor pole and the singularity, and in principle, you could have half the horizon R minus minus, but this is completely negative. And we know that the singularity is positive, so I'm not taking it. It's not part of the space time. <coughs> when you have the situations, this horizon is cosmological, this is an even horizon, and basically what you have is a black hole of the sitter type. Okay? And this black hole is actually regular. Why is regular? Because the my space time, which is start in the region R plus, I am at the infinity, and I know that my space time ends in this asymptotic region and at, at R equal M. But I don't have access to the singularity. And where is the singularity? The singularity is beyond R M. 
So my, my space-time, actually, the R plus region, has no singularity at all. And it has two horizons, R plus plus and R plus. You see why it's regular? Of course, if now I analyze the region R minus from M to a singularity, there is a singularity there. But there is also one horizon, this R minus. Okay? This is a different space-time. In this space-time, there is a curvature singularity. And in this case, it's naked because when the cosmological constant is negative, this horizon R minus is of the cosmological type. So actually, I am not properly covering the cosmological, the, the curvature singularity, and then this region is not so physically interesting. But the region R plus is a regular black hole of the Sider type, where there is no curvature singularity at all, and where the scalar field is actually regular, because the scalar field diverges here, in this region. You see? What happens if, in this case, I decide to move further from this restriction of the mass? What if I decide to kill these two horizons? Then my space-time here is going to be everywhere time-dependent. Because remember, this is the Sitter type. I'm sorry, this is a cosmological horizon? Yes, R plus is cosmological horizon. And the Cauchy horizon is inside the... This is cosmological horizon, even horizon in an horizon of Cauchy type, yes. <clears throat> this is the region in which the conformal poles diverge. But my scalar field do not diverge in R equal M anymore, because this is the transform scalar field, right? My transform scalar field is this one. And this zero is in the singularity now. So it's, I don't care about it now. It's in the other region. OK, so just to go fast. This is going to be, if I kill these two horizons because I cross the, this, this uh, constraint, I, I won't have horizons. This is going to be regular everywhere. And moreover, it's going to be of time, uh, of a cosmological type of space time. OK? But there's one more thing <laughs> that is interesting is that now, <coughs> If in this case you compute the determinant of the two dimensional sections, which is basically the, the you know, to compute the determinant of the space time, it gives me a measure of the volume of the space time, right? If I compute the two dimensional determinant that gives me, gives me a measurement of the two dimensional volume that I obtain when the coordinate t and r are constant, so I'm just taking care of the angular coordinates. I see that this is the expression. And because my space-time is of cosmological nature, this f of r is always negative there. Right? And if it's always negative there, this minus, cha this minus change to a plus. And my volume is always positive. So th this immediately solves the problem of possible um, close time life curves, right? Because it's going to be always positive. But moreover, it also tells me that this volume has a minimum, and this minimum is non-zero. So this is what is giving me the, the bounds of the cosmology, the minimal volume that then expand again and contract and expand again. Okay? And you can see, to find the minimum of this function is pretty difficult, so you can do it numerically. And you see the following. You see that for several set of parameters, lambda, n, not charge, march, uh, sorry, mass, and the product of a and b, that, of course, all of them satisfy the constraints we put from the very beginning in this solution. You can always find this minimum. And this minimum is always lying in the region of interest. So beyond R equal M. So in this case, when there are no horizons, what we have is simply a bouncing cosmology. You see that? OK, so basically, I moved from I was in a regular Sitter black hole with this cosmological and even horizon. I slightly, continuously moved the mass, so I was beyond this uh, restriction, and then I got a bouncing cosmology. This is the type of like, bounce we were looking for, right? And nobody asked me, but if you actually, here, instead of going beyond, you saturate this value, both horizons merge into one, and then you have the following solution. When both horizons merge into one, these are the conformal diagrams, the Pernod's diagram of the solutions. What you have is that uh, you have a wormhole. Wait, wait, wait. Yes, you are here. If both horizons uh, collapse into one, you have one uh, 
cosmology, it, you have here one bounce, so you have a cosmological bounce with a kind of um, cosmological horizon here. And in the other case, <coughs> if the bounce is beyond or let's say that now, okay, you have to analyze again the minimum in the case where the two horizons are, are there, right? So I collapse the cosmological horizon, I collapse it with the even horizon in only one. There is one cosmological horizon, but there is a still a minimum of the volume somewhere. This volume is not, it, it didn't change, right? Now the volume might be beyond the cosmological horizon or inside the cosmological horizon, right? When it's beyond the cosmological horizon, what I have there is a bouncing cosmology. So I have a cosmology that at some point goes through a minimum and then I cross this cosmological horizon and my space time becomes again R dependent. In the other case, when the bounce is here, what I have actually is that I am, I am coming from infinity and at some point I cross this cosmological horizon. So I was at infinity like in a kind of uh, cosmology. I cross my, my, I cross my, even horizon, my um, cosmological horizon and inside I face a minimum of the volume. But this minimum there is not time dependent because it was time dependent when it's outside the cosmological horizon. When it's inside it's R dependent. So what I have there is a wormhole. A metric that is R dependent but has a minimum volume. And what you, are ha what you have in that case is a wormhole in a Decider universe. So you are in Decider universe, you, everything is time dependent. You cross the um, cosmological horizon. And once you cross this horizon, you became stationary again, your metric. But in this stationary phase, you face this minimum of the volume. There you have a wormhole. And then, of course, this wormhole connects with this region R equal M, which is the asymptotic region where the conformal factor pole sends you. No? This is happening only when you collapse both horizons. So basically, what you have in this case is the following the Seeder black bounce. So when the mass is restricted like this, you have a regular stationary black hole. When the mass is uh, saturated, you have either the bouncing cosmology that I show you with, an, with a cosmological horizon inside, at some point you cross to a stationary phase, or you have a wormhole that lies inside of the seated universe. And when the mass is beyond this one, you have a bouncing cosmology with the minimum I show you in the plots. Okay? Now, this case is interesting, but it's not the most interesting. Why? Because it's the sitter. And in this case, you cannot fully get rid of the closed time like curves, neither the missing string. Why? Because we are in the case k equal 1. And that's a problem. So this case is interesting only if you say, OK, I am under the conditions of the Clement blah blah work that says that I'm going to consider only geodesic observers. If I am a geodesic observer in this space time, I'm not going to face the missing string and I will be able to also avoid the closed time life curves. And then it's pretty interesting. Okay? But if you're in the case lambda negative and k equal minus 1, there is no uh, missing string for the case of uh, an hyperboloid foliation. And moreover, because the cosmological constant is negative and we know from the seed that under some conditions the <coughs> the closed time life course can be completely removed, then that case is much more interesting. And this is the case for lambda negative and k minus 1. So doing precisely the same things I did before, I'm not going to show you. This is the, the conformal diagram of the black hole and so on. You will obtain the same. So a black hole which now has is regular, there is no curvature singularity, and now instead of a cosmological and an even horizon, you have an, an even horizon and an inner horizon. Your metric of, is of anti de type now, so there is no cosmological horizon blah, and so on. This is the, the Penrose diagram. This is completely regular black hole. And in here, the cosmological constant satisfies precisely the constraint that allow us to be completely free of closed time like curves. Fair things, so no pathology in that sense. And we are in the case of hyperbolic foliation, so there is no missing string also. Both pathologies are solved and there is no curvature singularity whatsoever. Then you can again collapse two horizons. When you collapse two horizons, you get something pretty interesting, which is a regular black hole of anti de type with a single horizon. So I am in infinity, and let's say, well, again, you have two cases. Either the minimum of the volume is outside the horizon or inside the horizon, right? 
when the minimum is inside, what you get is the following. This is a, some, it's a regular black hole with one even horizon. Now it's even horizon because it's not cosmological horizon like in the previous case because it's anti -acetal. You have one horizon. You can cross this horizon and then you go into a, some kind of cosmology, interior space time, right? You know that you, there's no singularity, but there is the new region R equal M. But inside, there is a minimum of this cosmology. So it's a black hole, regular, one horizon, that on its interior has a bouncing cosmology. Okay? Because the bounce is inside. And if the bounce is outside the horizon, actually what you have is that you are coming from infinity and you face the throw of a wormhole. And this wormhole uh, <coughs> let you out in another region. Up to some point, you cross the even horizon. Sorry. Up to some point, you cross this even horizon and you enter in this cosmological phase and you face R equal M. This is a wormhole, an anti deceitful wormhole with a black hole inside. And this black hole inside is regular again and one horizon only. If you don't saturate any of them, so you don't have horizons at all, then what you get instead of a, cosmology, of a bouncing cosmology is a wormhole, an anti deceitful wormhole. So basically this ADS black bounce goes from regular black holes with inner and even horizons, then I saturate the mass and I get a regular black hole with one even horizon. This is pretty important because most of the problem with these solutions, this regular black hole solution, even if they are solutions to some system or they are just proposals, they have usually two horizons, the even horizon and the inner horizon. And usually the inner horizon is unstable. It suffers from some uh, instabilities that are known, instabilities known as uh, mass inflation. And what it implies that if I am a particle going into this regular black hole, I cross my even horizon, then I will go close to the inner horizon. And I know that if I close the inner horizon, there's not going to be any singularity, right? That's the idea of the regular black hole. But nevertheless, me as a particle, I will perturb a little bit the inner horizon. And this inner horizon, because it's unstable, it's got, the perturbation is going to grow up up to infinity. And it's going to be so much energy there that I'm going to create anyway a new curvature singularity on that horizon that wasn't before. So it's pretty conflictive to have this instability in the inner horizon. So here you have a black hole in which there's no inner horizon, so there's not such an instability. So that's nice. So this is the, the end. This is the last one. And some comments of what we are doing with this. We need to study thermodynamics. We would like to study the Euclidean solutions. Because I told you that UNAD is pretty appealing from the Euclidean point of view and some higher curvature corrections. And just as the last slide, this is something we are doing with Jorge. And the idea is to take the case in which there is no cosmological constant. If you see, there is no lambda here anymore. And the idea will be also to kill the NAT because we don't need to go in this complicated case with NAT. And when there is no NAT here, if I kill N everywhere, this solution was already known and it's called the Barcelo wormhole. Okay? And the idea will be to put this metric into rotation. Why? Because we know it's a wormhole, this metric. And we would like to make it rotate. Because there are no rotating wormholes, exact rotating wormholes. Because there is charge, there are two strategies to make rotate this. One is to put this black hole into an external magnetic field. So imagine that you have a kind of solenoid. You know the solenoid? So you have a cylinder with this solenoid and this produces a magnetic field, right? That pretty close to the axis of symmetry of the cylinder is almost um, constant. And then it opens a little bit the lines. So let us say that we are in the approximation in which this is a constant magnetic field. I'm going to put a black hole there inside this solenoid. Okay? Because of the interaction of the solenoid magnetic field with the charge of the black hole, the black hole is going to start rotating. What we are going to make rotate this metric by doing that, but this is a wormhole. So what we are going to obtain is a rotating wormhole. This is one thing. And the other is uh, with some other techniques, generating techniques to include rotation, but not via the um, external magnetic field, but with a pretty similar strategy so that these solutions also rotate. And the idea is going to see if this is going to be or not, or not a, a rotating wormhole. So yeah, well, that's it. So thank you for your attention.